Hello, welcome to our August 10th, 2021 Club Cubase live stream. I'm going to do just a quick audio test to make sure everything is coming through as expected. Bear with me just for a moment and then we'll get started here in just a couple minutes. Hello, welcome to... All right, so my monitor and computer sounds okay. So my name is Greg Undo. I'll be the host for the live stream today. If you have not attended a Club Cubase live stream, how this works is you could ask questions in the chat field or email questions in advance to clubcubase at steinberg.de. Um, so that way we can get your questions. We'll try to go through all the questions in chronological order. Questions can be asked much faster than my ability to answer questions. So if you don't see an immediate response to your question, uh, if we could try to refrain from uh, asking the same question repeatedly, it just kind of slows down the whole process, having to read through the same, if a question has been asked seven or eight times. Uh, so we can get through a lot more questions. Um, I'll try to give an, a periodic update as to where I am in kind of the, uh, with the timelines. Um, just a couple of quick announcements before we get started. So if you are watching this live, please feel free to introduce yourself. Tell us where you're from. Uh, a couple of people uh, deserve some shout outs for their efforts. Uh, so we have Jan from Stockholm. You may see him on the live stream is cubaseindex.com. So we will have all the topics covered uh, in the live stream today, all the questions uh, with timestamps. It will be available at the top of the comments field pinned to the top. But if you want to search for topics in uh, previous live streams, you can go to cubaseindex.com and search there. Uh, another wonderful resource of information that you could take advantage of in addition to all the official Steinberg uh, resources is the Cubase Nation Discord. And I know Jazz Dude is involved with that. We have two people that kind of help out in moderation. We usually have a very well-behaved group, but uh, if needed or if they could answer questions while I'm trying to catch up. Uh, so just a quick shout out to Jazz Dude and Agent K. Uh, so once again, my name is Greg Undo. I work for Yamaha Corporation of America as a product specialist, primarily focusing on Steinberg products. Um, so uh, I'm presenting from outside of Washington, D.C. area in the United States uh, in Alexandria, Virginia. So we'll get started here in just a couple minutes. We'll see some more people getting logged in. If this is your first time attending a live stream, uh, introduce yourself and let us know. Uh, we usually do these on Tuesdays and Fridays, unless I have a scheduling conflict, but we've been pretty good. Uh, so, you know, we could come back and it's wonderful to see people from uh, the community, but we'll go ahead and get started. All right. So we have uh, Wolfgang Productions checking in from New Jersey and U.S. All right. And we see that... Anthem's Jam is getting his company engineering time on Cubase. We won't, uh, so we won't tell his company. All right, but. Okay, so we have a question. Uh, hey, Greg, I go from 10.5 Pro to Cubase 11 Pro. Where is the volume fader on export audio in real time? So in previous versions, when we would do like an export audio uh, and we chose real time, there would be like a little monitoring volume uh, with the new system, the new export audio mix down capabilities introduced in 11, uh, that volume slider kind of went away, um, but it's basically just the control room volume. So you may want to adjust the control room volume before doing an export. Um, is, I think it's still in a doc, listed in a documentation, but that was kind of the design intention that it would just use your control room volume for the monitoring during real-time export. So apologize for the confusion on that. Okay, so we see Jay from Connecticut. <clears throat> And Sir Robert from Atlanta. All right. And we had uh, is NJ Budaman from Nashville. We have Korean Jesus from San Diego. Um, 
Okay, so Jay from Connecticut has a question. I uh, have a general question. If 32-bit floating point essentially removes headroom concerns, I'm wondering what significant other differences 64-bit can make for production. So it will give you additional headroom, but it also will allow you, let's say if we're doing um, some like intense calculations, like reverb would come to mind. And if you wanted to actually, you know, have reverb tails that had twice the precision than like 32-bit floating point. So maybe you had like a squeaky clean acoustic recording with a big reverb. And if you exported in 64-bit floating point, you may notice a difference. It could be a very subtle difference, but I've had mastering engineer friends be able to uh, tell the difference, but if you're, you know, and I, I think one of the big reasons that we have, we introduced 64 bit floating point for the audio engine is now with like the AXR four audio interfaces and the URC audio interfaces, they feature 32 bit integer converters. So we needed to have more space if you actually, you know, for processing, and for the audio engine to process 32-bit integer recorded files, not 32-bit floating point, but actual converters that are capturing 32-bit. So and that's kind of where you see the benefit also is if you've actually uh, captured a 32-bit uh, from the A to D converter. So it's pretty rare, but, um, but many of the Steinberg interfaces, for instance, have it. Okay, so we have uh, Rob from Tarpon Springs. Uh, what do the different options in the export as drop down menu and export audio mix down window to the batch export uh, do to the batch export of stems? So let's go ahead and take a look. Okay, so we'll see kind of our different uh, functions that we'll have here. So we could, um, you know, let me just, Make sure. All right, I'm just going to read a question one more time. Okay, so when we see the export as, uh, if we're actually um, doing, you know, so if we wanted to see, so we have, you know, this is primarily dealing with uh, mono or interlead files. So if I was doing a final mix, um, you know, that's going to be stereo, which is the most common, you know, we can get into stuff like, you know, more surround based, but if I wanted to do a stereo mix where the two files um, were, interleaved so when i have one audio file where i see the left and right channels within the audio file when we choose to do these as split channels uh, we could have the left and right channels as two independent files that will need to be lined up if we choose a mono down mix i could create a mono version of the stereo file and then if we're doing surround, we could take the left and right channels from the surround and choose to mix with that. So if we were doing primarily, like I would say if I was at the point where I'm finishing the project and I need to create a stereo wave file to pass on for you know different services or burning CDs, at that point I would do interleaved if I was doing more stems. I would choose to do split channels, mono down mix. So some programs still don't really support stereo interlead files. And we'll just kind of do two mono files that will be locked together. But here, so th that's what it'll allow you to do is to choose between the different settings of if you want it to be interleaved as two stereo files or mixed down to uh, the stereo mixed down to a mono source. Okay, so we see uh, from Damien, DJ D Chainsaw, uh, I have a couple more questions where to mail these for answers. So you could just simply uh, send questions in advance again to clubcubase at steinberg.de or just ask them in the chat field here. Just where you ask that particular question.
All right, so we have a question from Neurotic Nexus. Is there a smart way to transform percussive audio, like sounds made by fingers drumming on a desk into MIDI notes? I'd like to record drums with my fingers. Okay, so let's say, you know, if we wanted to do this, uh, we could, I'll just come over here. So let's say you're just like tapping a kick or a snare um, and you've recorded it as audio. You could just turn those, let's say if I want to take like my kick drum in this case, and let's say that was my finger that I just kind of recorded, you know, in my creative moment, uh, we could, I'm just gonna have a MIDI track selected here, but if I double click, I could go into the sample editor and let's go to hit points. I will first kind of determine the hit points. So, and at this point we could just say, let's create MIDI notes. I could choose to <clears throat> have a fixed velocity or dynamic velocity, and I could put onto the first selected track and I could choose my pitch. So now I could just take what was tapped onto my desk and it's gonna create a MIDI note based on the audio. And if we wanted to synchronize these two, we can see that the MIDI has been extracted from the hit points from our kick drum. And you could just translate, you know, thumb tapping or anything like that directly uh, into MIDI that you could use to program. And if you wanted to even take your thumb tap and drag it to the sampler track, um, you could do that as well and just trigger your thumb tap and sequence that if you wanted to. All right, so great to see uh, Soren from Sweden checking in. Thanks for joining us. And we have uh, Gareth on the live stream. Great to see you. I enjoyed playing bass on the upcoming Hot Mess song. I think it's the first on the album, new, new album project. So, All right, we have Matt Elston from London. All right, and we have Sam checking in from Munich. It's one of my places I always want to go to. And we have Thermonuclear War from Serbia. Okay, and Michael from Quebec. All right, we have Toby from Koblenz, Germany. I'm sure he's pronounced that wrong. All right, so we have uh, Dwayne from Nashville. It's the first time on the live stream. And Michael Pierce from UK. And Super IZL from South America. And Somerset in UK, Mexico City, Claudio. All right, so we have uh, Lewis from Virginia, so a fellow Virginian, welcome. All right, and you see Millard Brown from outside Philadelphia. And we see Pete Hughes on his first live stream from Finland. Thanks for joining us. And we have James from Vancouver. All right, so we have a question. Uh, hello, everyone. My Cubase 11 Pro and Windows 10 hangs up in a splash screen at the hub. I have, I have to end task in Task Manager several times in order to get it to start correctly. Heard of. So usually when it gets to the splash screen, um, everything... You know, kind of is getting through the plugins. What I would do is as you go to like, you know, start the icon for Cubase is just hold down uh, alt control shift. So let's say if I wanted to start, um, I'll just do this. I'll show you kind of what we could do. And if, you know, it could be that maybe if you get rid of the current preferences and rebuild them. Uh, but if I do this, and I'm going to hold down like Alt Control Shift at this point, you could say I wanted to uh, deactivate third party plugins and disable program preferences. And this will kind of take you in from uh, a particular starting point, like a known starting point, uh, where it's not going to take any preferences or settings over from previous versions. 
So try that and see if that will allow you to get your Cubase open. And then, you know, it could be that it's migrating settings if you have a previous version of Cubase. So you could give that a, a quick shot. Um, all right, so just see question, I'll just get out of the window here quickly. Okay, uh, so question, wondering how to use iPad over Bluetooth as a pad MIDI input, trying to use controller app. Um, so I don't know, um, I haven't really done much using my iPad as a MIDI controller. Um, but as long as it is being seen by the computer's operating system, you know, it should be available to use a Cubase. So, you know, there are some, can be some odd things with Bluetooth, but if you could also let us know if you're doing it on, um, and this is for Michael Matthews, if you're doing on Mac or PC. So I know some uh, Bluetooth stuff, you know, for MIDI works only on Mac and there's kind of a set of non-standard standards on Windows. All right. Great to see Graham Witcher on the live stream. Glad you can make it. All right, so we see, is it possible to use the strip or maybe even inserts on sends? So, you know, if you want it to, let's say, you know, if I wanted to take, you know, like a plug-in, I'll just do this on, let's say the bass. So a lot of times we may run, you know, any of the plugins can be run either as inserts or sends. Uh, you may have to adjust kind of the plug-in balance between them. So I'll just make sure I'm not misreading this. Um, So, the, you know, the channel strip itself is going to be just a, you know, these plugins, like if you go to your noise gate, your compressors, these are all available as, you know, when we go to plugins. So, you know, we could have these, but we could definitely run, you know, these plugins on as sends as well. So you could just kind of come right over here. So if I wanted a gate on a send, it may not be the best use for that, uh, but you could definitely run anything on the send. So you could run the same plugins uh, kind of as an insert on the channel strip or as a send. So you could, you know, just do that if you're on an effects channel track that's been created. So let's say if I add an effects channel track. So let's add an effect. So let's say I wanted this to be a reverb. So we have our reverb and, you know, so if I come here, I could also just take, you know, like that particular reverb and add more, uh, you know, on that particular reverb return channel, I could run through my, on the return channel, it will have its own channel strip. Plus I could stack, you know, up to 15 additional plugins on that particular uh, reverb effects return channel as well. So if you wanted the reverb to go into a gate, going into a delay, going into a filter, you could do stuff like that to create kind of interesting effects uh, chains. Okay, so just see... Um, can I mute an event and have the track be disabled at the same time? So let's say if I have this particular track here, so that's mute it and I will come over here, right click and let's uh, disable the track. So you could do that, but 
So in so the mute status of it when you click here can if you're muting the event and let's see if we mute the track so that's independent of it being enabled or disabled. So let's say if I have this mute it uh, and then disable the track. So let's come here into the mix console. So say, okay, I wanted the kick track. So once it's disabled, it's not gonna show up in the mix console, but let's say if I enable, we'll have just KIK come directly back in. So I think that once the track is disabled, that it is kind of hidden from the mix console, which makes sense. So, but it looks like the mute status is independent of a track being uh, enabled or disabled. Okay, so we have a question. I uh, just purchased Pro 11. Should I uninstall 10.5 LE slash AI prior to installing the Pro version? So if you set up, um, you, you, there's no need to, they could both kind of peacefully coexist on your system. So if you have, um, if you spend a lot of time on your Cubase uh, 10.5, uh, LE slash AI coming up with like, you know, user, you know, with kind of custom keyboard shortcuts and you set up the preferences, you know, those information after you install Cubase 11 can be migrated directly over. So you don't have to uninstall, you know, the actual part of the program isn't terribly big. Uh, you know, in today's, you know, in today's programs, you know, in the content between, you know, 10.5 LE slash AI, you know, is all going to be a subset of what's in the Cubase 11 Pro. So, so you don't have to, uh, it'll, you know, um, so you can use both without any problems. All right, so let's see, I did a baseline for Gareth, uh, Michael Teams, and for Pablo. So I'm glad you like the baseline, Gareth. So looking forward to doing some more baselines for you. All right, all right. So you have uh, Joachim, I think, from Sweden, checking in on his first live stream. Thanks for joining us. Okay, so we have, uh, please talk about pan law. So pan law can be set um, in our project setup. So when we come over here to your project setup and you can hit shift plus S, you could have various states for uh, your actual pan law settings. So right now I have it set to uh, equal power, but you know, so if we were to think about taking a stereo signal, um, you know, and we combine two tracks, or if we double the signal, what's going to happen is, you know, like a doubling in volume would be an increase, you know, through physics of, uh, three DB. So, you know, a lot of people can adjust the pan law setting so that as you're mixing, if you wanted the tracks to, sound you know so as tracks will if you are taking the left and right channels and combining them uh you know what could happen is you could choose for if it's going to be the same level when you pan hard left hard right or as you go closer so at this point if you say minus 6 db when you go to the edges it could be minus 6 db softer and as you kind of bring it in so people will manipulate the pan law to make mixes sound wider. So a lot of people and mix engineers would use this uh, specifically, you know, to manipulate the pan law setting so that when they're mixing that they could have better stereo imaging. So, all right, wonderful to see Michael Teens on the live stream from Weatherford, Texas. 
And I think that the um, that now the, he's always the uh, person that's giving out virtual ice cream to people. So I think it'll all start. Um, so let's see, uh, hi Greg every, and everyone, uh, this is from David M. Uh, is the wave circle and supervision of any real use apart from looking great, uh, when other loudness meters are provided? Also, would you, would you think a VU is now obsolete? Um, you know, there's a lot of people that still like the warm, fuzzy, vintage vibe of a VU meter. Um, I don't think it's obsolete if you come up working with those particular meters. Sometimes, you know, they may not have as much relevance to someone who hasn't had that emotional connection with a VU meter. You know, I remember like the very first time I went to a studio, probably 1981 or so, uh, you know, my, my buddy Brian took me to a studio and they just switched to LEDs from, um, you know, from VUs on their console and the guys were just complaining about it then. Uh, but if you're not familiar with like kind of the wave circle, we'll show you this. I think it could be more visually interesting. So let's come over here to our main section. So I'll just switch this meter here to the wave circle. So, you know, you could have this kind of set up just to, you know, I think it, it does look cool, it's interesting, and to kind of see what's happened. And as you kind of go along throughout it, but it's, you know, maybe not the, the best uh, indication of metering, but sometimes it's always really nice to have eye candy in uh, your particular, uh, like if you have people coming over, you just want it to look cool. You know, it's good for that factor. All right, so we have a question from Gareth. Uh, what are the best export options for mono stems for mono channels, uh, mono down mix doubles the volume of mono channels, it seems. Um, so what I would do is if I was doing mono stems is, you know, and it could be depending on kind of your signal flow. Like if you're sending mono into a stereo group and then doing a mono down mix, you know, because then it's kind of going through the path but what i would do if i was just working with mono stems and like what i did for the baseline i gave you is i just came uh directly over here and i just chose on the effects so let's say if i go to the base part here um i would under the effects i would just choose disable dry and then that way it won't kind of go through the entire panning you know so it's, it'll make a mono track that's being routed out to a mono you know to a stereo output that will give you the mono source um, sometimes if you're then routing that through a stereo group it may turn it into a stereo file and then if you do a down mix you can affect the gain structure of the bass so I would just do um, under the effects disabled dry net will maintain mono tracks as mono and stereo tracks as stereo. So that's how I would approach that, Gareth. All right, so we see Neurotic Nexus. Uh, says, Thanks so much, Greg, just for the tapping the thumbs totally missed the hit point method amazing so that's great you'll be more creative with your drums you realize that your thumb drumming wouldn't be as accurate as you think maybe all right so we have michael upton checking in from uh liverpool uh, England, uh, can you show me the right buffer settings for recording i seem to have lag on my last two projects uh the current I'm currently using a Scarlett 616 interface. Thanks for Michael Upton. 
So, you know, you want, you can run as low a buffer as you want. So, and we could do that by going to your audio interface and going into the control panel and setting your buffer there. Now, as people put different effects and have effects in a project, you may get to the point where you have, uh, let's say if I just do like a multi-band compressor a couple of times here, that some of the plugins, as if they're introduced into this into the system or into the project, you know that could introduce latency. And if you're on Cubase Pro, you could actually see the latency if you go to the mix console here and choose to see channel latency. So let's say on those particular tracks, I introduced two multi-band compressors, and we can see that those plugins are causing 246 milliseconds. So Cubase is going to have to play back the audio 246 milliseconds earlier than what's actually happening. So if I was to record, I would have almost a quarter of a second of latency. So, and if you click here, you could see, you know, what plugins are causing what amount of latency. Now, a quick way to remedy this is what we call the constrained delay compensation. So if I turn this on, what that is going to do is it's going to bypass all of the plugins that have a latency above a certain threshold, and that is set in the preferences. So if you're like, oh, you know, suddenly it's like I'm, I'm mixing and I need to record something, you know, try just to turn on a constrained delay compensation and that will bypass the latent plugin so that it could be more responsive. So, uh, so the latency can, you know, be caused by plugins in the project in addition to the buffer setting. So people sometimes will just, I've lowered my buffer to 32 samples and then it's all of a sudden I still had this latency and it's just because maybe they put a plug in here on their master bus that and that's what's causing the latency not the buffer size all right so we have mark joining from nairobi kenya thanks for joining us We see Neurotic Nexus saying somebody actually hit the wrong icon, so maybe it's a like. So if you've learned something new, make sure that you do hit the like button. And if you haven't subscribed to the live stream, make sure that you uh, subscribe to that as well. All right, so we see uh, Glenn Dozier from uh, Suffolk, Virginia. Thanks for joining. All right, so we have music all day saying hello to me and everyone else in the live stream. All right, just going through more. So Michael Teens is on it with ice cream for attendees. All right, so we see Jazz Dude, I think, is uh, trying his Windows 11 beta. Going through all the great comments. All right, we see John Costigan's on the live stream.
Okay. Um, all right. So we have a question. Uh, hey, Greg, I'm saving my audio inserts into my own folder of presets. Is it possible to show the folders when loading audio inserts presets? So if you want it to come, you know, so if, you know, if you want to, uh, so as you do like, you know, track presets. So if you go to user presets, you could see your track presets. Uh, and then depending on what format it is, we could see all of the track presets. I know some people may just, you know, label it and then search for bass or, you know, kick or whatever. Um, and if you go to the file browser and let's say, you know, if you saved everything into a particular folder, just come over and you could right click and add favorites. And then when we're in the favorites area, you could just come here. And at that point you could just drag and drop. Um, so if you have everything in all of your user presets in a particular folder, just you know, go to the file browser on the right hand side and find that and just add that to the favorites. And then you can navigate quickly to kind of your folder structure if you wanted to. Okay, so it's just see from uh, Jay Hopkins. Um, okay, uh, hi Greg, I'm getting comb filtering in my CC data when I am re-recording uh, after setting replace recording in editors to controller. Uh, it works for my CC1, but my CC11 is still having the comb filtering. Okay. Okay, so come over here and one of the things that you can do is, you know, there are different MIDI recording modes. So if you want it to, um, you know, so while you're here, I would probably choose to, you know, if you're doing cycle linear recording modes, I would probably instead of merge, you know, make sure I think that merge uh, might be, you know, or it might be set to new parts by default, which will take the existing data. And then as you record over it, you know, so if you recorded like, a, you know, notes with um, the expression or a CC, and then you just record the CC on top of it, that the two can be kind of, uh, you know, basically, you know, you could have the existing part and the new recording on top. So you could choose to merge those or just choose to replace. Um, so, you know, go to the MIDI record modes. You could do it from this icon in the transport bar. Or if you go to transport and you'll see, uh, you know, your MIDI record modes, you know, try, you know, try merge or replace as opposed to new parts. Okay, so you see from uh, Jay, immediately pull out FL Studio and Reason for super quick uh, percussion sketches without heavier DAW, but only mention because I and others would far rather use Groove Agent. Uh, could you please ask Steinberg to make Groove Agent a standalone VST host so that we could use a lighter, more accessible tool, especially my friends who DJ and, and live shows who I layer for? Um, so, you know, it, Groove Agent is this, you know, it is a standalone VST. So I'm not sure if you need it to be a standalone VST host, like to host other plugins. But, you know, if you have, you know, the full version of Groove Agent, you know, there's Groove Agent and Groove Agent SE. Groove Agent SE comes with Cubase. But if you have uh, just the full Groove Agent installed, I can come. Let's see if I, I think I have it installed. So here I could just load up Groove Agent, Halion, Halion 6, you know, and at this point it's just a standalone program. So the full Groove Agent 5 here. 
Uh, and then, you know, when you go into the pattern, you could actually go into the pattern editor and make your own. So if you have, you know, the full version of Groove Agent, or if you have like, you know, which is sold separately or comes as part of the absolute collection, you know, you can just run it standalone. The Groove Agent SE will be tied to Cubase. Uh, but the full version can run standalone or as a VST AU or AAX plugin, I believe. So, Okay. Um, okay. So I just see kind of the same question. Maybe, maybe I didn't understand it. Uh, so thanks, Greg. Is there a way to put an insert effect or a strip effect on the send bus and not the return bus? So it, maybe if you could uh, indicate what exactly you're trying to accomplish. Um, but and if if what I showed earlier didn't make sense, but you know if there's a specific workflow like I need to get a reverb to do this or a compressor to do this or a reverb and a compressor to accomplish something that would be helpful. Okay, so I just see uh, where can we control this in the preferences. Um, so I, I don't have the context, but I know we mentioned the preferences for the delay, you know, for the threshold, you know, so if you're looking for the threshold for the de for for delay introduced by effects plugins for the constrained delay compensation. Uh, if that's the preference that's being referred to, I think if you go to VST. Um, let me just find the I thought it was under VST, but let me just. Okay, so yeah, under VST, go to uh, delay compensation threshold for recording, and then you could set the amount of delay compensation there, so. But let me know if it's a different preference you're referring to. So, Okay, uh, so we have a question. Um, is there any way to program uh, to set multiple loop in and out points while playing back a sequence in real time without using a ranger mode? Uh, 
Okay, so let me just. Okay, so any way to set multiple loop in and out points while playing back a sequence in real time without using arranger modes. All right, so let me just. Okay, so, you know, if we have, let's say, a marker track here, so let's say we're playing. Um, so I'm not sure if you want it to come over here and say, okay, I just want to insert a cycle marker at these different points. And then, you know, if you wanted to just hit P, we could have that kind of be set up for the loop in and out points. Um, so let me know if, uh, and this is from uh, Planet YD, uh, or Planeted, um, but let me know if that kind of is what you want to accomplish. All right, so we see from um, uh, Cubase Index uh, from Jan, uh, is there a quick way to calibrate check many tracks for more than 100 in an ongoing project or do I have to put the tone generator plugin on each track? Um, so if you needed to do that, one of the things that you might be able to do, Jan, is if you don't want to set that up where the tone generator is on a hundred tracks. So let's all right. So let's say I have 16 tracks. Okay. So, you know, one easy way of doing this is, you know, if you just go, if you want to put the tone generator across all of, you know, let's say across all of these tracks, you could just hold it, you know, if you enable quick link and then let's go to your tools and now you could have the tone generator automatically put on all the tracks. Uh, if you want it to So let's say if I now wanted to turn all of these off, I could, you know, select all the tracks here and turn off the tone generator. Um, another way that I've seen some people do it is to, uh, if they're all routed to like the same audio input. So let's say if I go to my input channel on my mix console, so let's say, So let's say uh, my input channel will have the test tone generator. And then I could just set, you know, the input. I think if we hold down Alt plus Shift, we could now say, okay, this is all going in mono in one and mono in one will now be just automatically mapped to all of the tracks. So you could uh, do it like that as well. So that way you just route the same input and on the input channel route as an insert to test tone generator. So let me know if that makes sense for you, Jan. Okay, so I just see kind of uh, a quick, uh, just probably going back to our, our cycle questions. Uh, the purpose is to go in and out of a loop during a live set uh, at several places in this same sequence. Yes, yeah, so I know people that will set up uh, like their live sets 
Um, I think Donny Osmond kind of had this set up for his live shows in Vegas where he knew there could be like a little vamp part. So as he was uh, going along, you know, he could just say, okay, we're playing, you know, we're playing back our tracks here and I just want that to loop. So while it's, you know, while we're here, I could just hit P. And, you know, we could say, okay, now I just want this part to loop. And let's say now I don't want it to loop. So if you have cycle markers set up, I could say, okay, now as we are going to here, you know, I could just say, I just want to hit P and you could do this with, you know, any MIDI controller and then turn on loop. So while you're playing at this point, you know, when we get to the end here, it'll just automatically loop. And then I could just take the loop on and off with a MIDI note message through generic remote. And now if I'm playing along, instead of it looping, we want to get out of that for a live amp. I just disable that and it'll turn the loop on and off. So if you have those kind of set, or if you know, okay, you know, like this, I want to have as a cycle loop, you could just, you know, insert the cycle marker and even as we select, you know, have a macro just to loop that one particular section. So we have a lot of people doing that for live stuff. All right, so we see kind words from Luca. It says, thanks, Greg, uh, for our recurring dose of knowledge. So glad to help. Okay, so I see question, how to clear favorites in Media Bay. So let's come over here. Let's jump back to our favorites. So let's say if I want it to come over here, let's say, okay, I'll go to, Okay, so let's say if I wanted uh, dark glass as a favorite. And then. I'm going to jump over to my favorites here. Okay, so all you have to do is in the upper right hand corner, just come over here and this is a good song on the hot mess CD. Uh, but you could come right over here and just click in the X. When you hover over it, you'll see an X in the right hand side. And do you want to delete uh, the favorite dark glass? And then it'll still be in your particular uh, project. So if you go to your file browser, dark glass is there, but it's just not going to be in the favorites anymore. So just kind of hover and look in the upper right hand corner where you see the X and that will delete it as that folder as a favorites. All right, so you see Randy Lee checking in. Great to, great to have you on the live stream. Right, I see Pablo has joined the live stream as well. All right, so we have a question from uh, Tim Weinheimer. Um, hello, Greg, this is a general question. How many hours do you put into a song or anybody else before, uh, before you would you say it's finished? I need a strategy to get them finished. Um, I remember talking with Hans Zimmer about this 
And, you know, we're doing an interview with him and it didn't make kind of the final spotlight interview. But the question was, um, you know, I'm like, how do you know when you're finished as a composer? And he just kind of burst out laughing and he's like, when a director comes and says, give me my music. So, uh, you know, having a deadline is a really a great creative tool to have, even if you just make up a deadline. You know, I've seen interviews with Paul McCartney where he's like, okay, I'm going to write a song in two hours. I have to get it done in two hours. And I just have to write my song or I'm only going to do this for, and give yourself, even if it's an artificial deadline, but make yourself stick with it. And, you know, it, so, but deadlines, you know, I, I think that if there weren't deadlines for composers that, you know, nothing would ever get finished and it's only finished because of a deadline. Many, you know, big album projects are the same way. You know, many songs that were, uh, ended up being big hits were kind of a throwaway last minute production that they just needed to get something done really quick because they're on a deadline. So give yourself a deadline and, you know, it's, and I've seen some artists have, you know, some you know, like legendary artists, you know, that have completion anxiety uh, because they just don't want to finish a song because they're being judged by their own back catalog. Um, I think Sting was like that for a while. Billy Joel, I don't think, has written a new song because he's always comparing himself to his old you know, his old catalog, which is, you know, it's great to have a, an amazing catalog, but if it prevents you from still being able to express yourself, you know, so give yourself a deadline and say, I just want to do this and I want to get this done in a certain amount of time. Like I have to do something else. I have to take my son to football practice and I want to get something done and accomplished before I have to leave to go to football practice or do a family thing or before dinner and just make yourself do something and get it done. So otherwise, you know, and I, it's the same for, you know, I remember I did some Cubase consulting for a guy who did like really high quality portraits, you know, and I was just like, I'm like, how do you know when the face is done? He's like, yeah, this has like, you know, 52 layers of paint and it's the hardest thing knowing just when it's done. So Give yourself a deadline. All right, so. All right, so Gareth wants people to mark the like button. Okay, so we have a question. Uh, I would like to duplicate audio events and have different time stretch algorithms for different duplicates, but when I change one, it changes all. How can I make them independent? Okay, so let's say I have, um, the, these two and I wanted to have, you know, cause generally the time stretching algorithm is going to be uh, for the particular file, you know, the audio file that's within the event as opposed to being in the event. So if I want it, this to be, you know, Elastic Pro Pitch, and I wanted this to be Elastic Pro Tape, that now when I kind of go back and forth, because it's referring to the same audio material, that it's going to have the same algorithm because the algorithm is applied to the file. But if I want it to go to audio to bounce selection and choose to replace events, now I could say I want this one to be tape and I want this one to be pitch. And now when I click, we see tape and now I see here it's pitch because it's going to be based upon the file as opposed to the event. So just do a quick bounce selection and then you could uh, have them with independent settings. All right, we see Pablo's giving a very enthusiastic, Pablo's received a very enthusiastic greeting from Gareth.
All right. Uh, so we have a question from uh, Thermonuclear War. Uh, Greg, one question. Uh, maybe it's not exactly about Cubase 11, but I must uh, to ask, how to reduce high-frequency peaks in mastering? Uh, they can make problems uh, when they come to limiter. So a lot of times, you know, that's when you could use like a very traditional like multiband compressors are really good for this. Um, you know, and Cubase has kind of a wealth of multi-band savvy plugins so you know if you're so if it's just kind of like the high frequencies are coming out harsh in the limiter you know maybe do a different approach is that you know and run it through like a multi-band compressor and what that's going to allow you to do so i'll just Go here to my dynamics. So at this point I could apply compression just, you know, just to particular frequency ranges. So if I wanted the bass to be really tight and very compressed. So you could just kind of take the high frequencies and you could adjust so if you find that those are being harsh, instead of EQing it, just try maybe compressing those particular frequencies and then unsoloing it there. And then you could mitigate problems. So this is why there's a lot of you know multi-band plugins because this will allow you to do a particular uh, approaches now if you wanted to be even a bit more surgical you could get into so this will allow you to adjust kind of the you know like this whole frequency range here but maybe I want it like it to be tighter Q and then if you want that uh, to have even a higher level of control, you can get into the frequency EQ. And because the frequency EQ in version 11 will have not only, uh, you know, we could have a dynamic mode. So when we come here, I could take band three and I wanted this to be a really tight Q. So at this point I could just say, okay, let's adjust the Q here to be a little tighter, and then I could apply the dynamics uh, just to that particular Q in those frequencies. So using kind of the dynamic EQ aspect of frequency or a multi-band compressor, I think will get you a long way to kind of solving uh, any harshness that you may have in, imposed by a limiter. All right, uh, wonderful to see Steve Cummings on the live stream. Uh, is there any chance that Cubase is going to offer support for H.265 video anytime soon? Uh, having to convert uh, when importing any video, uh, always great uh, get great info in these meetings. All right, so I'll just make sure. I, I know that they're always, you know, they're, they're working on additional video stuff all the time. I'll just make sure. All right, so this is kind of the website that has kind of all the different. Um, so I will see if I, I'll, I'll, I'll definitely mention that to the developers, Steve, but you know, video codecs are kind of a, a moving target all the time, but I'll definitely kind of pass that on so that we could, uh, you know, mitigate, you know, you know, having to do, you know, so many stages of conversion as well. So.
All right. Uh, so I just see from Kai Wen Franklin, uh, Greg is it just me that is having a hard time telling if you have updates available using the Steinberg Download Assistant. Well, you know, if you go to the Steinberg Download Assistant, you can see, you know, a lot of times, like if you, you know, subscribe to the newsletter, but, you know, you get notified or when you go to the hub here, you could see like, you know, different product announcements as they're coming up here. So you say, okay, um, at this point you can say, okay, here's the Cubase 1103 maintenance. And so, you know, you could see, you know, what's new. And if you want it to, at this point, you know, download that particular one, um, you could just, you know, go to the Steinberg download assistant. So it's not necessarily tied into your particular license, but, you know, just look in the hub and that's a good way of being notified of different uh, updates that are coming out, but it's not going to automatically do that. And I think there could be some like EU privacy reasons and stuff like that as well that tie into that. Okay, so we just see uh, how to master a song properly. Please explain. You know, so it's kind of a, you know, a lot of times when people think of mastering, and people will have different uh, perceptions of what mastering in it, what mastering is. So if you ask a mastering engineer versus uh, someone who's just doing, you know, a project, uh, maybe in their own studio. So let's say if we have, you know, something like. I have a two track. So a lot of people consider mastering kind of, you know, doing processing on kind of the stereo mix of a particular file. So if I come here, um, I may want to say, okay, as I'm working with this, run it through some plugins. So I'm taking kind of the whole mix and often the goal of mastering is to make kind of consistency in a recording so that when you're doing different things that you know, like the different tracks will sound you know consistent so a lot of times people will come over here and they will choose to eq and make sure that sonically and here we could just kind of listen to the changes so say oh i put a little sizzle but maybe just at the edges. So I could put this into like a mid side and just make the edges. And let's say I wanted to kind of get the levels up a little bit. You know, a lot of times people will just kind of do processes like these. So say. And can do mastering like that. So, you know, but other times people will do mastering as, okay, I want to make sure that the songs all have consistent volume levels if you're doing an album project or if you're mastering just a single song. So it could be really different. Uh, depending upon this scenario. See other people saying that deadlines are important for them finishing stuff. Okay, so just see, uh, while exporting, I have an issue with some instrument samples or dropped at random parts, especially on contact instances. Uh, this does not happen in real-time export. Has anyone experienced this? 
So, you know, if I run into, when I run into stuff like that, it's kind of, you know, the plugin is often going to be the culprit for that. So. And we see Real Raven has a great quote, albums aren't finished, they're abandoned. So. And Millard Brown strategy says, I used uh, release parties at local venues to push the need for a deadline. All right, Michael Teams and Gareth want people to hit the like button. All right, so in the live stream, I'm at about two, uh, I'm about one hour in, so I'm about 12 minutes behind. Okay, so we have Ted Springman. Great to see you on the live stream. Uh, Ted's from Sherman Oaks, California, in the LA area, in the valley. Um, so question for sound design purposes. Uh, if I want to do extreme stretching of audio for effect, what is the best algorithm to reduce unwanted artifacts? All right, so let me just find a quick sound file here. Hang on one second, my son is knocking on the door. All right, I'm back. Sorry for the interruption. All right, so let's say if I was wanting to do more time stretching, I think I had an issue showing this uh, on my system the other day with the processes, but I think, all right, so if we wanted to come to the time stretch here, um, I would probably do maybe the elastic. Um, you know, so you have your different time stretch algorithms. And here we can see, you know, bars, you know, beats or, you know, so you can do it in sample seconds or BPM. So I would say that, you know, these are MPEX. Um, these algorithms are maybe older, not necessarily bad. Uh, but, you know, when you get into you know, custom sizes, you could adjust the grains here in the custom uh, warp settings uh, if you wanted to customize different things. But you may, and it could be different, these different files would, you know, yield different results on different audio files. Um, I may start with the MPEX, or I'm sorry, with the Elastic uh, algorithms and kind of start there uh, and see if you could find, you know, because these would all treat the different, um, you know, the different processing algorithms. If you do have WaveLab, there is an algorithm in WaveLab called Dirac, which is, uh, which is very, very high quality time stretching algorithm as well. But I would probably start with the Elastic algorithms and then uh, explore from there if you need to. Uh, so you see, does Steinberg have any products that either print or detect thumbprint data embedded into audio? Um, 
So I don't think so. Uh, you know, uh, I, I don't know off the top of my head. Wave Lab, um, you know, can I, I don't think it does. Um, so when you say thumbprint data, I mean, there's metadata. Um, you know, that can be embedded, you know, I'm not sure if it's, you know, when you say thumbprint data, but you know, if there, and there's, you know, metadata and audio files sometimes can be just a whole wealth of non-standard standards, but you know, WaveLab will have kind of a whole, um, metadata set. So if I just wanted to come here and be able to edit metadata so you could do, you know, for, you know, different, uh, you know, ID3 lyrics for pictures. So that's for dealing with, um, let's say if I go here and let's edit the metadata. So you could actually pick, um, you know, this, these as different metadata options uh, within the broadcast wave, within the IXML, you have CART, which is kind of the AES standard. Um, so you'll have some of those, but I'm not sure if it does thumbprint necessarily, but a lot of those can be, a lot of different standards for metadata can be applied in WaveLab. Going through comments. Thanks for all the great questions. Okay, we have a question. Uh, hello, how to make a minimal arrangement sound bigger aside from reverbs and doubling instruments? Um, you know, sometimes. You know, so let's say, let's, let me just open up a project here. And we could treat this one pretty minimally. It's mostly going to be kind of vocal and piano. So a lot of times, you know, people go for... You know, so here we have space from the reverb. We're going to have the piano. But, you know, sometimes I think people, you know, overthink things in their arrangement. Um, you know, and just because we have, you know, uh, you know, the ability to have so many tracks and, you know, hundreds or thousands of tracks doesn't mean that we have to use them. So... I'm kind of a big proponent of making sure that like arrangements are correct. Um, you know, sometimes when you have instruments, if you have a few instruments and they're like the guitar player and keyboard player kind of stepping on each other or the piano player is stepping over the bass player or the bass player is stepping on a guitar player that, you know, a lot of times you find that tracks that sound really good are arranged really well. Um, and they kind of don't have those clashes where you're kind of fighting the particular frequencies. And if you do that, I, you know, like there's a reason that we have kind of standard instruments that are often used in a lot of pop productions because they just kind of work and get out of the way of other instruments. And, you know, I see some people that try really hard to be clever and then it doesn't really add that much to the song so you know sometimes you know I've, I've talked to songwriters you know very successful and like you know every note every sound has to have a purpose and a reason or don't do it you know and don't have you know, any fills, like when the singer is singing, don't do a guitar fill, don't do a piano fill, wait for the singer to stop, and then you have space to kind of work. 
Um, so, you know, I would kind of err on the side of listening to a lot of great records. It's not in records that you think sound big. If you take the individual parts, the individual parts don't sound that big. Um, but it's kind of when they're all pieced together that that makes, um, sense. So, but if you have a particular project that you're having problems with, you know, you could send me like an MP3 to club Cubase at Steinberg.de and I'd be happy to, um, to, you know, maybe give some advice on that. Okay, so just see, um, time question, uh, time stretching a project by marking uh, the tracks as musical mode in the pool increases the export time of a project from around 50 seconds to five minutes. Uh, any solution is appreciated. So if you've done a lot of real time time stretches on a particular file, you know, once you're in the sample editor, um, you could just choose to flatten the particular audio file and that way it's not doing you know it's basically just you know applying those changes to the file as opposed to having to do it in real time so that's something that i would maybe check out so if you've done that on lots and lots of tracks i would maybe look to that All right, so we see that um, Tiago James from Brazil loves his Cubase and he's waiting for the next version. It's great. You know, I'm sure you're not the only one that's waiting, but I'm sure there's lots of people in Germany working hard. All right, and we see uh, Chief Theodore checking in from London. So we're doing great. Thanks for joining us. Okay, uh, so just see from Jay, uh, Groove Agent, my friends are now asking that they will control external VSTs with the pattern generator, but I've only used inlaid sounds. How can we load VSTs like uh, Moto Drum with Groove Agent? All right, so let's take a look. Um, haven't tried this, but we'll give it a shot. All right, so let's say I have uh, my Groove Agent pattern here. All right, and I'm just gonna go ahead and play this pattern. And let's say if I wanted to play this pattern, but with another drum sound. So I have another, I'll just do a, a drum sound in Howling and Sonic SE. Okay, so let's say. All right, so let's say I want to now have Groove Agent play these sounds. So, you know, when we're playing uh, Groove Agent, we could now come over here and as soon as it's playing the patterns, we could set the input to this track from Groove Agent. So even now, if I mute the original, it's just playing back sounds. And this is with, you know, Groove Agent SE.
So, you know, once you have Groove Agent playing, it can actually just send MIDI out directly and just take the other instrument and load the MIDI, you know, it said it's input from Groove Agent and the patterns being played from Groove Agent are now just playing in other devices. So if I just want to play that together, you could just do that very easily. So let me know if that works for you, Ted. Okay, so I just see from Wayne Murray, uh, Cubase 12 without the dongle, any news update on this? Um, so nothing has been announced. Uh, I'm sure that when it's ready to be announced that they will, so. Okay, um, so I just see um, when I do several bounces using audio warp, uh, some warp editing than bounce, more editing than bounce and so on. I see waveform changes almost every time uh, altering audio events. So yeah, if you're doing you know warp editing that will, you know, you are kind of just changing kind of you know rhythmic aspects. So let's say if I wanted to come here, I'll create warp markers from my hit points and I'll go to my audio warp and we'll just enable free warp. So if I come here, you know, you are adjusting the waveform uh, as you work with this. So that could, you know, um, so, you know, you are altering the waveform. Um, so when you see the waveform changes almost every time altering the audio events, that's, you know, what you're doing in essence is, you know, altering and moving the different, you know, warp markers. Read through more comments. Okay, so I just see a question. Uh, how do you stream? Let me just find it again. Okay, so here's a question. Uh, how do you stream audio to YouTube? Is a mixer required? So depending on your audio interface, you know, some people will use different, um, uh, you know, different audio interfaces or different utilities like voice meter. Um, I, what I use, you know, because I have to read all the comments and, you know, it's kind of like a, a very complicated dance to do a live stream, reading the comments, doing it and transmitting and being on YouTube. Uh, so what I have is my setup that I found to be like very reliable, especially if I need to change sample rates and different things is I take my microphone. Um, I, I use uh, UR24C audio interface, um, the Steinberg UR24C audio interface. I take the analog outs of that into a Yamaha USB mixer. My microphone is connected into the same mixer. Uh, and I use the mixer for the broadcast. And so the audio is just going out to my Yamaha USB mixer. It's like an older MW12 CX or something, I believe is the model. Um, and that's what uh, is being heard. So if I need to mute the microphone, I could just hit a button quickly. Uh, but a lot of people will use, you know, like a loop back feature of their audio interface. Uh, and to enable that, you could come over here. Let's say if we go to applications, um, I think we, it's under DSP mix effects. So say for my particular interface, if I wanted to enable loopback, 
uh, we could just turn that on. Uh, so MIDI interfaces will have that. So, um, so the, those are a couple of different options. I use a mixer and just kind of keep everything clean so I don't have to worry about uh, changing sample rates and configuring other utilities. Okay, so we have uh, from Renee Lame, Lame, um sorry if I pronounced your name wrong. Uh, Renee from Quebec here. Can you explain the difference between bounce versus render in place? Okay, so, you know, when we go, when we're dealing with, um, just revert this. So when we're dealing with just audio files and we do a bounce selection, that will make a new audio file just kind of like we, what we showed earlier, but that doesn't include any of the EQs that may be in the channel, it doesn't include the inserts or the send effects. Um, and bounce selection will only kind of make a new audio file. You can replace the audio file, but it's not gonna include any of the processing. If I was taking a MIDI file, you know, doing, you know, I can't even do a bounce selection because I can't turn that into, I can't bounce this selection if there's no audio there. And this is where render in place comes in because I could take a MIDI file and if I go to render in place, I could take that MIDI that's going to a virtual instrument or to an external instrument that's routed, that has its audio routed into Cubase and I could just go to my render settings. So with MIDI and audio, I could choose to create these as, like if I have multiple events, um, you know, I could create it as separate events, as block or one event. I could have it be dry with the channel settings, and this includes the channel strip, inserts, and EQs with a complete signal path, which means which adds the send effects or the master effects. We could have different naming schemes here. We could choose, you know, custom names. We could choose a different file location as opposed to just being only in the particular um, project folder. And, you know, here we could also just mute the original sources or disable particular sources. So bounce selection is only going to be taking an audio event and maybe that has like lots of edits and consolidating those into one new audio file, but not including the effects to render in place can have a lot more flexibility for naming different effects, processing options for audio and MIDI. All right, um, so we have a question. Uh, is the control room also useful with only one pair of monitors or headphones? So yeah, there's a lot of great uses for it. So let's go ahead and take a quick look at some of the difference. So if we only have one pair of you know, monitors, you know, some of the things that you can do in a control room is have a known reference level. So when we go to our control room, you know, I could come over here and so say, this is the loudest that I want to mix. I could dim it quickly uh, and you could set the dim amount just by kind of right over here. Now there's also, you know, we could solo tracks and the other tracks get muted. But when we have it going through the control room, we could also listen to tracks so I could have the other tracks just kind of dim down so now when I hit solo all the tracks are muted but if I want to hear this in context but have that kind of brought up we could click on the L button we also could have different down mix presets so if I'm mixing in stereo and I wanted to see what my mono down mix sounds like 
And then a lot of functions like, okay, if I wanted to do scrubbing, you know, I could come over here and that gets routed through the control room. So, you know, and hearing edits like while you're doing very audio or previewing loops, these will all be kind of done. And, you know, because we don't have, you know, we don't have this routed to a track. So as we're auditioning, this will go through the control room. So those are some of the benefits of using control room, even with one set of speakers or headphones. Okay, read through more comments. All right, so um, I just see. Okay. Um, all right, so hello, Greg. Uh, when changing from track to track, I'd like the VSTI associated with that channel to auto populate, be linked to that track. Uh, is it possible? So if you want to, you know, see the particular instrument, um, so let's say if I jump to this particular project here, So Cubase won't automatically open up the, uh, you know, when selecting a particular track, um, it won't automatically open that. You can assign a keyboard shortcut. So let's say if you go to your key commands, I think if you just go to edit VST instrument, that you could assign excuse me, uh, just assign a key command for that. And that's going to be under the edit. So, but you know, it's not going to automatically when I come here, just automatically, you know, pop open the VST instrument that's going to be used on that track. But if you just use that key command, you know, because sometimes I may want to, you know, tweak around with Groove Agent while editing, you know, a different part or have a different part selected. So I think to me it would be, you know, could be more annoying to, you know, constantly every time I select a track, see the instrument pop up. Um, but, you know, having a keyboard shortcut and then I'm, I have a CC 121 controller and it just has a button. So when I want to see the instrument for this particular device. I could just click on that particular button or assign a keyboard shortcut to just trigger each particular instrument just like that. So, but there isn't a way you could just, you know, come over here and edit the VST instrument that you want, but you know, I think <clears throat> it could be annoying to every time you select a different track, you may not want to see that instrument pop up. So if you're especially if you're editing it, editing against uh, other parts. So <clears throat> excuse me. Okay, um, <clears throat> so see, question, hi, there's a default behavior with new instrument and MIDI tracks I'd like to change using expression maps. Uh, the change velocities checkbox is active by default for new tracks under dynamics. Can this, um, can this be changed for new tracks? I don't have to do it manually every time. All right, so let me just go to a new project.
Okay, so I just added an instrument track, so... Um, Okay, so we say under expression maps, I'm not sure if it's in the editor, so let's say. Okay, so there's default behavior with new instrument MIDI tracks I'd like to change using expression maps. The change velocities checkbox is active by default for new tracks under dynamics. Let me just import one with expression maps on it. Okay, so I don't know if it's when you add the track or if it's when you're here. So let's say we just try one that has some expression maps on it. All right, my Cubase didn't like that project. So let me just. to reboot my computer here. Just give me a okay, I'm gonna reboot my machine real quick. Uh, so just bear with me just for a couple minutes while I reboot. I have kind of a weird IT thing in my computer, so it takes me uh, a minute or two to reboot. So just bear with me, I'm just gonna restart. All right, so I think I'll be back here in just a second. Let me just do a quick check on my monitoring computer. Sorry about that. Okay, so let me just see if we get the let me just check, make sure all the audio is coming through okay. Okay, so okay. All right, so um, let me just find my spot with the question. Sorry about that. Okay, so let's take a look at new instrument or MIDI tracks. So let's say if I 
come over here to, uh, it seems like maybe it's in the expression map setup. Okay, so it says I'd like to change, uh, using expression maps, the change velocities checkbox is active by default for new tracks under dynamics. All right, so I'm gonna add a new track here. So let's say if I add a new instrument track. All right, so it just says, um, using expression maps, change velocities checkbox is active by default for new tracks under dynamics. Um, so I'm just seeing the change velocity. So I'm not sure if this is what you're talking about, Michael. Um, let me know, or if you want to send me a picture, uh, I'd be happy to kind of take a look at it for you. Okay, so I just see uh, from Kai Wen Franklin, I asked for a lot of metadata fields to be added to Cubase during exporting of MP3. Uh, I put the request in the Steinberg form. So I did check with uh, some of the Steinberg people on this. So, you know, the metadata fields that they use are kind of what are considered kind of the standard. And if we added additional metadata fields, they probably wouldn't be read by any program that reads those particular metadata. So, um, you know, so if you had like a particular subgenre of gospel music or something like that, it, that there's a chance that if we added those things that they wouldn't be recognized by uh, a lot of uh, MP3 metadata readers or, you know, programs that are able to do anything with that particular metadata. So. All right, great to see Cubase Junkies made the live stream. Thanks for joining us. I see Jay just saying the Prodigy is probably the act which their most requested EDM comes from. That was in the 90s. So I think I lent them an Atari computer once in the mid 90s for a gig they were doing in DC when their Atari died on them. Okay, so I see, uh, so from ProWash DFW, just saying the thumbprint data is acoustic signature as an acoustic ID software. So I don't think uh, any Steinberg programs will do that, sorry. All right, so we just see, I uh, didn't know Groove Agent had a MIDI through revelation of the day. All right, from Michael Pierce. Okay, so I just see, um, so I meant VST hosting Groove Agent as a standalone non Cubase loaded host to control VST to handle map to another VST like Moto Drums. So let me see if the standalone version is from Jay to standalone version of Groove Agent also will send MIDI data out.
So, you know, depending on, you know, if you have a MIDI loopback, you might be able to do it. So maybe if you send it like on a Mac through IAC bus or like Hubie's loopback on Windows, I believe is a utility that you might be able to just send it directly there. But if you're doing it inside of, uh, you know, inside of a host program, you could do that as well. But you should be able to send out the MIDI data, I think, even in standalone. All right, so we see that Pablo has invited Michael Pierce to three days in Galicia, España. So. All right, wonderful that Christian D68 could join us for a little bit then. All right, uh, so we see, is there an update plan for the Yamaha software for the classic uh, UR824 so we can use input settings in Inspector? Uh, I have also bought a UR44C in the meantime for mobile recording, but can't. I, I think that the UR824 could do it, but the UR44C, um, so we've been trying to, you know, that software link part is actually done by our colleagues at Yamaha Japan that manufacture the uh, the hardware and the drivers and we keep kind of, you know, bringing that to their attention. So I, I'm not sure why they haven't, uh, resolved it, but you know, I'll make sure to mention to that, mention it again to them. So. Okay, uh, so we see from Jeff Sabelski, great that you could join us, Jeff, from Chico, um, California. Um, so Greg, with volume track PP to, or Pianismo to Fortissimo, especially input and score and dynamics lane, 13, 13 minutes is working, or 13 minutes is working, fine tuning the volume sections need fine tuning. What are the easiest techniques to edit a section? And so probably if you're you know doing this, um, it could really depend, uh, you know, your dynamics can really depend, you know, on the instrument that's playing it back. So let's say, uh, if I wanted to go to, um, you know, let's say our violin one here and let me just get my audio settings. that you know when we want to come over here depending on what the instrument is set to respond to so uh you know if you want it for notation or if you want it to be played back you know this could be two different uh beasts when working with this so let's say if i want to now look at it in the instrument and I'll come over here to the macro view. So we're gonna say modulation is gonna be our expression control here, this old uh, HSO, we could use modulation or often expression. So if I just move my mod wheel, And this will control kind of the dynamics of how many you know, musicians are being kind of brought in. All right, so it say it says input and score and a dynamics lane. Um, so fine tuning the volume sections need for fine tuning. So you know if you know like you while you may be able to do some of this in the score editor for like really fine level of dynamics. And if we go to, you know, your dynamics mapping here, you know, we could actually just say, okay, let's say, I think if we go to the mapping and double click on it, and here you could say, okay, I wanted to send volume of, you know, CC7 or CC11. So whatever is going to control that. So 
you know, try using, I'm not sure if you're using, let me just make sure, reread it one more time. Okay, yeah, so if you haven't, if you want to do a friend to score editor, you know, you can go into the dynamics mapping, and then when you, uh, if you double click on it, you could say, okay, I want it to increase the velocity, or I want it to send volume or send different controller data. So you could, at that point, have this automatically send the controller data based on this, but not from the dynamics, but from dynamics mapping. So, All right, so we see, does render in place uh, work with external devices like a digital piano? Uh, so if the piano has been, uh, if the piano, you know, the piano needs to have its audio output connected to an audio input of the audio interface and configured as a, uh, so when we come to your audio connections, so if you've dis if you have configured it as an external instrument, so let's say okay, it's going to be my montage, and it's you it's connected to these inputs on my audio interface, uh, and you're routing it as an external instrument. At that point, you can do a render in place because you know Cubase can send the MIDI to it. It's going to happen in real time because the you know the external piano can't generate faster than real time just due to physics. Uh, so, but you would, but it could capture and you could render in place. So there's, there may not be a huge benefit of rendering in place versus recording the audio in. Uh, so, you know, connect the audio outputs of that, play the MIDI information and capture the audio input, you know, like the old Mackie mixers, you know, they would have a separate bus and it was like really good for this because, you know, they called it an alt three, four bus and you could hit the one button and you could have like the alternate bus and have that connected to audio inputs on your audio interface. So when you wanted to print the external MIDI stuff, you could just hit that button and it would, you know, you could have a stereo bus that was routed internally uh, to other inputs of your audio interface, but but you can do it, but it would, you can do a render in place for an external instrument, but it would need to be connected and configured as an external instrument under the audio connections here. All right, so we see, uh, it's like, wow, never knew about the listen option, great tip. Um, okay, so I just see uh, from John Costigan, uh, hi Greg, I'm trying to insert blank measures on some tracks, but not all. What's the technique? Thanks. Okay, so let's say I have this piece and I want to insert, uh, I'm just gonna use my range selection tools. Let's say on these tracks, I want to insert blank measures. So I'm gonna select with the range tool on the selected tracks. I think we could just come over here to range and choose to insert silence. And notice that the other tracks didn't change but the other tracks will stay the same. And then if I undo that, so only these tracks that had the range selection on will be affected. So once you do that, just come over here to range and insert silence and only those tracks that you have the range selection on. If you do this globally, you could do that, but you can have the range selection just on particular tracks. And again, edit to range, insert silence. And then that will just move over those particular tracks without affecting the other ones. Boop. 
Okay, so we see, will Cubase 11 come out with an IC app uh, to Remote Studio, any tablet, just as you guys did for Cubase 9.5? So the IC Pro will work for, that's available for iOS, but that works in Cubase 9.5 and Cubase 11. All right. Um, so let's see, uh, from Cubase Chunky. Hey Greg, do you know if we would have a little bit of a darker theme in the future in Cubase, kind of like the same color as Groove Agent, that'd be nice. So let's go ahead and just look at Groove Agent in comparison. So we can see that this is a little darker. All right, so let's say if we have kind of, if I wanted this level of darkness, I think that you could probably go to your preferences and let's go to uh, under user interface. So, and we'll see color schemes and we can see the project area background. So if you want it to, we'll just move that straight down and hit apply. Uh, and then that pretty much will match up. So try again, coming over here to preferences, to color schemes, to project area background. Um, so I'll just put that back to our default value and hit apply and you'll see it'll get a little lighter. So, and here you could adjust you know, the, the project editor backgrounds, different color schemes that you want there. So if you want it darker, you could tweak it a bit. Okay, so we have a question. Uh, is there an easy way to export different MIDI tracks playing from the same instrument separately? Okay. Um, all right, so let's take a look. You see this is darker now, the project area background. Let me just tweak that back to normal. Okay. Okay, so let's say we're gonna have um, okay, uh, easy way to export different MIDI tracks playing from the same instrument. So I'm not sure if it's multi-timbral or not. So let's say I'll start off with an instrument rack. Okay, so there's some different techniques for this. So let's say, okay, we're gonna have So I'll just put these all on. OK, 
Okay, so I will Okay, so let's say if I wanted to select these and let's just try a quick render in place. Okay, so now I think this might be So now if we just kind of do that, only kicks, you know, so if we kind of select these different ones and let me just get my screen back here, sorry. So that's how you could, you know, so just select uh, like the track here and just come to, you know, the render in place. And now each of these will just do a quick render in place. So I'll have my kicks rendered, snares, claps, and hi-hats. So that's how you could do it, just kind of like that. Let me know if that's what you wanted or if you wanted to do something different. All right, uh, hey Greg, can you show us how to make a headphone uh, 3D ambisonic mix with stock plugins like multi-panner? Um, so when you kind of come over here, let's just, uh, let's see if this is the project I was thinking of. Okay, so once we have <clears throat> added a, under our audio connections and we have a ambisonics output, we can get that set up, uh, you know, so we have our multi-panner set up here. So let's say if I just wanted to take like the stream here. And now I just wanted to kind of pan that behind you. So once we do this, you need to have uh, the headphones as the preview channel, and then you could just have the ambid decoder uh, as the, you know, once we go to our phones channel here, <clears throat> you'll see that the ambid decoder, it will be uh, just set up here. So you just say, okay, let's go, you know, our, our standard, and you could have it set up for head tracking as well. So you can do that all as part of Cubase.
All right. So, um, <clears throat> so I just see Michael is just saying, uh, I think this is, uh, oops, I should have specified the CC lanes area. So let's say when I go to add uh, a MIDI track to this. So let's say when I go to the, like, let's add a MIDI track. Um, so as soon as we do this, we could see, let me just, I'll start with a new project here. All right, so I'll just do this so we can see the articulation. So I'm going to just select this to uh, velocity, but let me just check. Okay, and let's see if I add a new MIDI track, you can see that. Or if I add a new instrument track, that now the editor here will be set to velocity. So I think that the controller lanes will kind of stick to whatever the last selection was. So let me know if that works for you, Michael. Okay, uh, so I just see I have a mini Nova. How do I connect it to Cubase to record the sound? Um, so I think that's, is it uh, maybe innovation, but you, you, so you probably just need to take, you know, the audio output from, I assume the mini Nova is a synthesizer. So you could just simply connect that directly into your audio interface, the outputs from the mini Nova right into your audio interface and just be able to, um, you know, just, you know, just be able directly to, you know, rec you know, play the MIDI out to it and record the audio right in. So with the UR24C, just take the uh, outputs and, you know, patch it right into your inputs of your UR24C. Okay, and it says I have every cable won't recognize the keyboard sound. Uh, I'm just gonna do a quick look at what the mini Nova is here on my other computer. Bear with me just for a second. Okay, so it's Novation keyboard. Let me just look at the back of it. All right, so it looks like there's a headphone out or a quarter inch left right outputs um, of the mini Nova. So it looks like you could probably just patch that directly to um, to your UR22 or to your audio interface. So it's probably not gonna be done over USB, probably just take the actual output. So probably the MIDI information will be transmitted by USB. So it looks like maybe it's quarter inch outputs where you can connect the headphone outputs. Okay, so on the timeline, just for reference, I'm at an hour and 45 minutes in, so I'm about 34 minutes behind. So just as a quick reference. Um, what does it mean when you freeze a track in Cubase? Okay, so if I have an audio track with lots of effects. So let's say if I'm here, and it used to be when we would use, uh, you know, prior to computers getting super fast, you know, if we had audio 
with lots of processing. So let's say, okay, I am here and I want to take like this particular vocal. And as we listen to it, we had different effects on it. So let's say, okay, I'm going to come here and add a send effect. Let's add an effects channel track. So let's say, okay, I want to add a reverb. So let's add a reverb to that. And let's say I want to put a delay. I want to be creative with this. And I'm going to run just a quick delay. And then filter the reverb. So. Okay, so now let's say like this was too much for my computer. So what I could do with freezing a track, whether it was a virtual instrument, is what freezing will do is we click on a snowflake and that will basically render that particular file. And now it'll play back in the background and it's going to, instead of playing through all these effects in real time, all of those effects will be embedded on the track. So if you had like a virtual instrument that was too much information, so let's say if I wanted to come here uh, and I this synth was just, you know, sending gobs and gobs of data and it was killing my CPU, like in the early days, what I could do is just go to that VST and click on the freeze icon. And that would render the file and I could do this with the instrument and channels. And now that particular track in the background plays back an audio file that could take significantly less processing resources than this particular instrument. So that's what freezing allows you to do is basically to render in the background files. We can think of it as kind of a precursor to render in place with not as much flexibility. Okay, so we, uh, going back to the dynamics, let's say question with the lane. So I'm just gonna come here. Okay, so we have our dynamics lane set up here. So I think uh, Michael wants to get rid of the dynamics here. Um, so let me see if There's a way to just get rid of the dynamics lane. I think it might be kind of coupled together with the expression. So let me just take a quick look. But I think it's gonna be coupled together. Yeah, I think that those two will be coupled. Uh, sorry for my confusion, but let's say. Just activate this project. Sorry about that. Let 
Yeah, so I think if you, you know, even if you store it as a preset here, that may get rid of it, but I think that the dynamics will be linked with the articulations. Okay, so I just see, uh, hi Greg, uh, still about the question about bounce and audio warp. Audio warp surely alters waveform, but multiple audio warp bounces shows incorrect waveforms resulting in clipped audio if done too many times. So, you know, if you're doing a lot of warping, let's just go back to this project. All right, so let's say if I come here and I'm doing my warping, all right, and let's see if I have the fader down for the channel. And I'm here and let's say I've done warping. Sorry. All right, and let's see if I go to um, bounce selection. That will apply the gain. So, you know, make sure if you're, all right, um, So just see uh, multiple audio warp bounces show incorrect waveforms resulting in clipped audio if done too many times. So, you know, make sure that as you're doing, you know, so let's say if I'm here, you know, it could be that sometimes you might be doing some other sample editing that could be affecting the gain stage. Uh, but I'm not sure if just warping like this would affect the gain structure. But uh, if you have a file that you want to share with me, you could send it to clubcubase at steinberg.de. Okay, so I just see, I don't know how to input external MIDI when it doesn't register. So if you have your MIDI device uh, connected you know, let's say your MIDI controller is connected via USB and you go to the MIDI port setup. If you don't see it here, you may have to install a driver. Not all MIDI devices are, you know, are class compliant or plug and play. So you may have to install the driver. So if I, you know, came over here and uninstalled or turned off, you know, particular like I turned off my CC-121, it just automatically disappeared. If I turn it on uh, in just a minute, we'll see that the CC-121 will appear again. So it's just kind of depending, and that's kind of at the operating system level. So if you don't have MIDI data coming from it, um, you know, you should be able, you know, to have it registered. Um, so, and it says, uh, shouldn't MIDI cables alone do it? So, you know, if you are if you wanted to record it as audio, the MIDI cables or USB cables, you know, aren't generally aren't going to pass audio. There are some devices and instruments that will re pass audio. So, you know, if you're trying to capture the audio from the Mini Nova, a USB cable is not going to transmit the audio. It's just going to send the MIDI data. And generally the, uh, you know, the audio, you know, the audio is not going to be transmitted over USB. The USB is just going to transmit MIDI data. So USB, the MIDI cable shouldn't, you know, allow you to patch in the audio.
And you just see it gets complicated when it's not in the list. So yeah, just make, if it's not in the list, then you probably need to install the driver for the mini Nova. You see green Jesus is also kind of replying to the same thing. I'm just finding my place. Sorry about that. Okay, so I'm back in my spot. Sorry about the delay. Okay, and I also see Jeff Sabelski saying, you know, at times Cubase won't see my MIDI keyboard hardware because my OS doesn't see it. I need to replug my replug MIDI Motu at PC USB cable uh, end. Frustrating, but it works. So. Yeah, if you know, the MIDI interface isn't being seen by the operating system, then Cubase can't access it. So, Okay, so I just see what's the best way to upload old MP3 slash CD tape tracks and remaster the original tunes on Cubase 11 Pro. So you could, you know, if it's an MP3 file, you could import an audio file and just select the MP3 file. If it's going to be on uh, tape, um, tape tracks uh, or, you know, you could also if it's on CD. You, would, you could just come right over here. Uh, if it's an audio CD, you can import uh, straight from the audio CD. If it's an audio file, you could import, if it's a data CD, you could take the audio file and import it from the, uh, from the CD or copy it over to your computer's hard drive. And if it's coming from a tape, you have to actually record that in. Uh, there's no way, it's not digital information, so you'd have to actually transfer it in and recorded as audio. All right, so I just see, uh, Greg, currently I use a Mac program called Tag Edit, which is cool, but just wondering if Steinberg could give us something similar, just asking. So, you know, sometimes they, you know, they go with, you know, very specific standards that are standard. So, um, you know, for reasons. So, you know, sometimes you may have tag, you know, other tag editors that could add metadata, but if it's not read by what other things, it doesn't do you much good. Yeah, so I just see um, the Steinberg from Tim Weinheimer. The Steinberg license and login is unavailable today in North America due to maintenance. Uh, if anyone's having a problem with those issues. So, yeah, I think there was a fiber optic line that went out from our internet service provider in Germany that's causing it. So, I, I, I got an email message about that earlier.
Okay. Um, so you just see from Terminal Nuclear War for 32-bit plugins, I won't change older Cubase with Win7 for Win10 and C11. I will buy new computer so many projects is with C5. Okay. So, yeah. Okay, so we have a question from Orrin Bynum. Great to see Orrin on the live stream. Uh, we explain how I can send my song through Dropbox or we transfer to get it into Spectral Layers 1 in Cubase Pro 11, please. Plus, how can I separate the audio from the music, please? All right, um, so you don't have to use Dropbox or we transfer uh, to get it into Spectral Layers 1. So really all you have to do once, if you have everything installed is come over here, let me just go to find my file here. So to get the audio into, into Spectral Layers 1, really all you have to do is Select the file, you'll go to your audio menu to extensions, and you'll see spectral layers there. This will launch spectral layers. And then if you go to your process, you'll see, or layer rather, you'll see uh, unmixed stems. And I have kind of the big version, but I could say, okay, I want to unmix uh, vocals. And at this point, it'll do its magic. We'll see kind of it doing its calculations here. So now that I take this particular track, Now I could just solo the vocals and my other instruments. If I want to mute the vocals. So if you just want to get it into spectral layers, sorry about that. If you just want to get it into spectral layers, just select the file, go to audio extensions and go to spectral layers. Uh, so that's really all you have to do, Oren, with that. Okay, so I just see from uh, Michael uh, about the mini Nova, says it recorded audio and didn't play back, it printed the waveform. So make sure that you have the audio, you know, the studio set up. So if you recorded the audio, you should hear it, but make sure that you're still not in record enable or you're not in monitor enable and play it back. Um, so I see does Modi X work through USB? So I think that the Modi X will actually transfer uh, audio over the USB and MIDI, but most people choose not to use the audio capabilities because they have an audio interface and you can't really record a microphone or a guitar impedance line level into the Modi X. So it's okay for transferring audio over, but you know, think of one time of, you know, you have one, think of, you know, basically with USB, you have one interface at a time. So make sure that if you, you know, have recorded it in, that you know you ha that the track isn't record enabled isn't you know set to monitor that's going to play back all right so we see john Costigan saying thanks for help with inserting silence
Okay, so just see from uh, Jeff Sabelski, then there's note input velocity. It's much easier to mix modern music than solo instruments with humanized expression. Groove Agent does it for us. Will Howling in Sonic. So you could, you know, depending on the instrument, you know, so I know, Jeff, that you have the, uh, that you do have the Howling in Sonic or that you have, you know, the, uh, orchestral librarian just not seeing it in here today but if you have um iconica you know you could have the players automatically switch uh and doing through the round robins for you to have that level of kind of different variations hang on my son's knocking on a door All right, apologize for the interruption. Okay, uh, so we have a question in Groove Agent. Could you assign, for example, a kick drum to its own channel in a mix console? Certainly. So you have 32 stereo outputs in uh, groove agent. So let me just jump over here. So if you wanted to do it, there's two different methods for doing this. Uh, one is if you're in beat agent or acoustic agent. So let's say if I wanted to come to my mix console here and I'll just open up, let's say I'll play the pattern here. So right now everything is going out of its own outputs, but if I go to the pad itself, so let's say I want the kick. So at this point I could just say, let's send it to out two. So now my kicks are gonna be route it to output two. So once you click on the pad, each pad you could assign to its own output. So that's how you could do it in like a beat agent kit. If you were doing more of a acoustic agent kit, you'll have kind of a different mixer view, but you could accomplish the same thing. So let's say we're playing along here. I could go to the mixer view and I could say, okay, Everything's now going out of this, and I could say, let's send my kick out of output two, my snare out of output three. So you could do kind of the same thing. So you have 32 stereo outputs to work with. It's probably enough. Read through some more comments. All right, great to see JVI in the live stream.
Uh, hey, Greg, could you try to make Runaway by Galantis without plugins so we could follow along? So I don't know the song, but I, I could uh, look it up, but I don't know the song, so it would be hard for me to make. And you probably don't want to watch me make a song, so it could be really boring. Okay, so I just see, uh, can I take all the lanes of a section for vocal lanes of a, for vocal takes of a verse, for instance, and have them all play simultaneously, or am I only able to comp them into one final audio event? Okay, so I think there's a, we could do that. Let's take a quick look. Okay, so let's say I have a number of takes here. Let's say. Okay, so now I have a number of performances and I wanted to take these lanes and let's say I have all these as lanes. So instead of, I wanted these to be kind of spread out. So what I could do if I select the lanes here, um, and right click, we could say create tracks from lanes. And now all six events, you may have to just unmute. Uh, but now you could have all of your stacked vocals or just six bass lines playing at once, which sounds pretty awful. Uh, but so once you have all the lanes, so some people will just do like quick uh, vocal comps that way you know if you're doing like gang background vocals it'll just do a different comp so open up the lanes select the lanes here just a shift key and right click and create tracks from lanes so that's a quick way of doing like multiple background vocals just have the singer sing a bunch of them in a row and then you know just have it loop over and over again have them just sing that and then you could have you know the 20 person singing thing and just a couple mouse clicks. Okay, so you see, um, I was asking about exporting individual stems using audio mix down options to send to a mixing engineer. I don't usually uh, render in place, but I see that would enable me to export them individually. So yeah, you know, for like a drum part in Groove Agent, you know, you could do that quite easily. Okay, I just see, hey, Greg, can we hear the song? So I'm not sure which song you're talking about. Um, but I think if you go to, if it's one of the Hot Mess songs that we all, that Gareth, Pablo, Michael Teams, and I played on, um, I think if you go to the Discord, you could listen to it there. Or if you go to Bandcamp, um, you could listen. And it's Hot Mess, H-O-T-T-M-E-S-S, -S, I think on Bandcamp. Okay, we have a question. Uh, hi, Greg. Is there a way to use different punch in and punch out points different than the cycle locators? Okay, so let's say I have my cycle locators here from measures one through eight, and I just want it to punch in um, only here. So we have these things called punch points. If you get a transport, we get a punch point. So we can say set punch points to selection range. Um, then at this point, I could have, let me just mute all of these 
bass part so it doesn't sound awful. So this way I could say on this particular track, I want, um, so I'm going to record, but I have my left and right locators set. And I think I have a preference set here. I'll just turn that off where the cycle follows the event range under editing. So cycle follows event range. So now I could have this, uh, I will at this point play. So now it'll punch in, then it's gonna punch out here and go to the cycle and then loop back. So this way we could give kind of a, like a little pre-roll and post-roll, if you will. So if you just wanted to come here and say, oh, I just want this part to be recorded, come over and go to your transport to punch points and say set punch points to selection range. And you'll notice that the left and right locators are now independent of the punch points. All right, so we see at two hours, 25 minutes in, we have 100 likes. That's great. Thanks for letting me know, Jan. Okay, so we see uh, from John Costigan, um, just find it again here. Hi, Greg. Uh, sorry, but I asked a wrong question. How do we insert empty measures ahead of certain tracks? Some are in folder tracks. So it's so you may have to open up the folder track. So let me just try. Okay, so let's say I have the kick, which is in a folder track, and the bass here. So I'm gonna hold down Control or Command to select those two events. Let me just hide this so we can see them. Okay, so I'm just holding down control or command on those two selected tracks. And now um, I'll come over here to edit to range, insert silence. And we can see that we just inserted the silence. And this kick is in the drum folder. So you may have to open up the folder. Um, and then the bass would be uh, and all others. So I just held down on the selected tracks, just hold down control. And then you can make kind of the same selection across both tracks without having to set them. So give that a try, John. Okay, and you can see that we're having a nice turnout. I kind of have my the chat on full screen, so I don't get to see all the active people. So I have to refresh last. All right. Um, all right, can you get into sample editing? So yeah, there's a lot of stuff we could do in the sample editor. It's kind of a broad question, uh, but you know, so you know, if we want to do, you know, a lot of stuff, I could say, okay, I just want it to, you know, take a selection 
Um, so, you know, we have kind of definitions where this is where we could, you know, adjust to grid. We're going to have different processing options. So if you say, okay, I just want it to come here and do a fade in of that event. I wanted to process a particular plugin on that. So let's say, let's just put a more filter on that. So we could do different functions. So if you want to see statistics, we could all kind of do this from the sample editor as well as, you know, setting up range selection tools. There'll be full hit point uh, editing. So from the hit points, we could have this automatically generate markers, uh, grooves that we could apply to MIDI, slice the audio, create warp markers, create MIDI notes. Uh, there's going to be very audio, which we could use for doing, you know, pitch correction of vocals and kind of monophonic audio sources. So I could just kind of come directly here and do my vocal corrections and we'll have audio warping where we could just say you know this note was a little early this is a little late we could adjust that and stretch it out it's just a quick overview of some of the stuff that you could do in the sample editor All right, so we have a question. Uh, how can I preview samples in Groove Agent 5 using up and down arrows without changing or pre-listening on current pad? Okay, so let's just start a new project here. Or I'll jump back to one of our ones that we had before. Just revert this quickly. Okay. So we could do this in like the beat agent kits quite easily. Uh, so um, whereas the acoustic agent kits are really kind of more uh, fixed by intention and design. So let's say if I'm in my groove agent kit here and I'm playing a pattern. So let's say I want to take So let's say I want to take this snare and replace the sound. Uh, I'll come over here to my folders and I'll go to instruments. So I'll say snare drums. So I have that selected. So now I could just come over here. And once I'm in that, I could just hit the down arrow and enter. And so I could select the sample here. So that's how you can kind of do it. Just select your different kits and then hit enter to load it. So that's a pretty easy way to do it. And so. All right, so we see a question about the marker loop is perfect, so. All 
Okay, so to see, uh, please help me. I cannot ride MIDI. I cannot ride MIDI CC and MIDI editor uh, more. I bought SSL UF8 and everything is gone. I can only read and write in the project now. Uh, I even only mouse and VST write no more. Thanks. So it could be, you know, if you're writing in MIDI CC data, um, you know, a lot of times people may get to the point. Let's say, okay, I have electric piano part here um so let's say if i move my modulation wheel up i get this like vibrato on it so without the mod wheel i'll kind of get that effect um so a lot of times people may come and let's i'll just write i'll record in some of the midi here Right, so it's like, so if you have the MIDI editor open, you know, make sure that when you're here that you have, you know, so if I don't have this open, right, and the MIDI editor is open, and I wanted to, and let's say I record. You know, you may not see that data in the editor, but you may have to just go into the editor here. And now that I've done that, we can see the modulation data just show up. So make sure that you have the, if you have the MIT, when you say you can only edit in the project, uh, or record only in a project window, make sure that you have this set to rec record in editor is enabled. Uh, so I just see, hi, Greg, is it possible to create custom chords in the chord track? All right, so let's take a look. I think we have a chord track in this. So, you know, you could have a lot of different chord spellings. You know, one of the things that, you know, we could do is just kind of come and I'm just going to randomly throw my right hand on keys. Uh, and we can say, okay, like, and I just played that. So it's a D major seventh with a sharp fifth over C. So you could come over here and have it do its own analysis for you. Now there could be different schools of thought as to chord name spelling. And if it's not showing up, like, let's say maybe, uh, you could come to the preferences and let's go to the chord track, uh, chords and pitches on event display. And here you could now create kind of your own custom chords that you want set up. So if you want it, this to be set up for, you know, like a flat five chord, if you didn't want it to, you know, you could now come over here and create your own custom chord spellings and create new custom chords. Uh, and so once again, in the preferences, come over here um, and you could pick and choose, you know, what how you want the different chord symbols or to make new custom chords or to interpret differently typical chord spellings. Okay, well, great to see Sable Winters has just kind of popped in to say hello. Okay, I also see Gareth saying the Hot Mess album is on Spotify, I believe so.
Yeah, so I just see from Mark, uh, thanks for the answer on punch points. I guess you can assign a key command to activate punch points. Cubase has so many hidden tricks. Nice. Yeah. See John Koskin saying, thanks for your patience, Greg. It's much appreciated. I'm just glad to be able to help people. Okay, so I just see a question from Jeff Sabelski. Greg, uh, seeing you with multiple projects open and activating one, how does Cubase handle the memory? Can too many projects open affect memory loads? So it's only the active project which is taking memory. So when you deactivate a project or activate a project, the project that was activated kind of unloads from memory. And as a project is being activated, it starts loading up whatever memory is needed for that particular project. So um, that way it will just kind of shuffle the memory for whatever the active or soon to be active project is. Um, so I see, hi, how do I activate straighten curve? Uh, I think, is this with the tempo editing? So let me just take a quick look. Um, but a lot of times if it's like for automation or CC data, you know, you can, let's say I have my CC data that looks like this, just kind of as a rule of thumb. If you select a number of parts and go to the center, that will kind of smooth out automation data, uh, MIDI controllers, or tempo data. So, and I'll just make this bigger so everyone could see it a little more obvious. So let's say I wanted to straighten out that or flatten that particular curve, go to the center right edge, and then you could make it more contrast or flatten just by going up or down with your mouse button. All right, I see that Gareth and his daughter are body popping to my killer beats. So didn't know I had that effect on anyone. So, but thanks for letting me know. Tell her I said hello and look forward to sharing your pizza with your family on Friday nights live stream. Right, reading through comments. Thanks for all the great discussions. If you learned something, make sure that you hit uh, the like button and you subscribe to the channel. All right, so I see, is there a universal strummer for MIDI or virtual instruments? So not really, but what a lot of people end up doing to kind of create strumming effects. Let's say if I have strumming here, if you go to this little trim tool, hold down, I think it's the Alt or Option key, and then, or let's try the Control key. Uh, let me just, so I'm just gonna hold down Alt or Option, and then you could just kind of split notes to create kind of strumming effects. So if you want it to be longer, you could do stuff like that as well. Okay, so I just see when is the next live stream? So generally we do um, we do the live streams on Tuesdays and Fridays starting at 1 p.m. U.S. Eastern. So you could figure out from there uh, 
when exactly the uh, time fits for uh, wherever you're living at. So it's 1 p.m. U.S. Eastern. So we usually do it Tuesdays and Fridays. Okay, so I had some questions that were mailed in advance. Let's go ahead and get to some of those. I think I'm caught up to live questions. Let's, let me just migrate over. Thanks for all the wonderful questions that people have asked and submitted. Hope everyone's learned a tip or trick. Okay, um, so just see, hi Greg, uh, I'm trying to get an SSL UC1 to play nicely with Cubase Pro. However, I've hit a snag when it comes to getting the UC1 to follow selected channel in Cubase. Um, and he had sent over a video kind of showing it. Um, so my question is apparently there's a link button in Logic that needs to be engaged for this to work. Um, is there something equivalent in Cubase Pro that I'm missing? So generally, you know, when you select a bank, uh, I haven't worked with the UFC one, but you know, if you have like an eight channel control surface, you may see like a little outline for all of the tracks here. So usually, I'm not sure. I know like my CC 121 that whenever I select a particular function here that that channel is selected. I haven't worked with that particular interface. I would assume that it would kind of work the same and from seeing it on the computer screen, um, the video that you had sent. Um, I do have a, a dear friend that works at SSL in the US. I could check with him to see if there's anything, but let me just see if there's, um, there's any kind of setting here for, so one thing it might be is maybe just check that if you go to editing to project and mix console that scroll to selected track Maybe that's doing it. Uh, I believe it's maybe just using a Mackie control protocol. So let's see if there's any settings in Mackie control that do that as well. So, you know, if you have this set up as Mackie control, there may be like enable auto select function there that might help you so that everything would uh, automatically be synchronized between the selections from the control surface. So try there. So once again, to devices, to device setup, and if it's Mackie control, you may have to click on the plus sign if you probably already had that set up, but maybe just click enable auto select. Okay, so we had this uh, um, from Johnny Diaz. Uh, how can I nudge or move around a selected event when editing in very small increments? Uh, I can do it with a mouse, but sometimes it's hard to get that surgical precision needed with my bulky mouse. Uh, can it be done using the arrows left and right, like in Pro Tools, or, and how do I do it? Uh, what Any settings I need to be adjusted? Thanks in advance. Okay, so we could tie this directly to kind of our grid resolution. So when I, if I have an event here, uh, you know, we can, if we hold down Control or Command, let me just get my keyboard shortcut right here. Okay, so if I have this selected, I can just hold down Control or Command plus my left or right arrow. You know, so if I wanted to, let's say if I had multiple of these events selected and I come over here, so, you know, generally the left arrow would just select like the next event in the tracks. But if I wanted to just move the particular event, control left or right arrow will move it based on 
this the snap value that we have set here. So now I could say, okay, I want this set to you know seconds, uh, and I could set you know this to ten milliseconds. So now you know if we zoom in enough here, I could any time that I adjust, it'll just move it by ten milliseconds. So you could adjust kind of you know, like the grid resolution. You know, so if I my master time is set to bars and beats, I can move it by beat if I want it to. So let's zoom out just a little more. So now I could just move it, you know, move the event over a beat at a time or a measure at a time or the quantized value. So let's say my quantized value is set to, you know, 30 second dotted notes. I could move it over like to the musical grid, just left and right arrow plus control or command. So give that a try, Johnny. Okay, so we had a question, kind of a follow-up question from uh, last week's live stream, uh, many thanks for including my question on the last podcast of 6th of April. My question was answered at 4455. Uh, my question is on exporting a group track. It mutes, ignores the effect sends associated with the audio track that's being routed to the group track. Uh, you tried and found that my question is reasonable, but you said to route the effects to the group track instead of the default uh, stereo output. But since that's an effects track, I may want to send other audio or group tracks to it. This will be a problem. Like if I have vocals, guitar, many other audio tracks, and I send them all to a common effects uh, track and then send that to an effects output to say drums group, I actually want to export would not be a disaster, sir. Ideally the group track on exporting should include everything associated with the tracks that are sent to the group. I mean, there looks like an issue that could be resolved in a future search. So, you know, again, it's, you know, if you have, um, let me just set up the scenario, you know, so if, you know, if you have the effect sends that are set up, you know, to be shared across multiple groups, you know, you could run into situations like that, but let me just, set up the drums and the guitar here in a similar scenario and try to recreate it. Okay, so let's revert this. Okay, so I'm gonna send all of my drums and let's say I'm gonna send these to a group track. Okay, and I wanted to send my guitars and my drums to an effects channel track. So we'll send them all to a two. We're gonna have a lot of reverb probably on this track now, so listen to it. All right, so one of the things that we could do is, let's see what happens if I just come over here I'll add a stereo audio track and let's route our drum bus as the input if this will include the effect. So Right. 
So, you know, since our effects aren't being routed to the group, you know, we could at this point just have this, you know, um, you know, so our effects, you know, so all of our drums are being sent to the particular group. Um, so, but our, if, or all of our drums are being sent to the group, but the drums are being sent also kind of in parallel to the effects bus here. So when we do like an export audio mix down, let me just see, I'll try this again just to make sure. I'm gonna do audio mix down and let's say I just wanna do my drum bus. And since the bus itself doesn't have uh, any particular, you know, it doesn't have effects on it, but the, the effects are kind of run parallel. Um, so let me see if there's a better way of, all right. So, you know, at this point, if you did a multiple export, Let's say I do my drum bus and the effects. All right, and we'll do these as And I'll just come over here. Let's create audio tracks. I'll just not do it in real time. Sorry about that. So, you know, since the uh, the tracks are, you know, this reverb is gonna be shared when you export it, you know, it would, you know, it makes sense that, you know, it would be uh, exported separately. So this way we could have all the effects. So, you know, it's still gonna be the best way. And this is what many, you know, mix engineers have done for years is just to route you know, the group track or the effects into the particular um, reverb. So at, at that point, but let's, I'll try something else here real quick, just had a thought. Um, all right, so we have this going on. And let's say if I go to the, this probably won't work, but I'll give it a shot. probably create a monster feedback loop, but let's... So I'm gonna take a send and try routing that to the reverb bus as opposed to just doing the routing and we'll see what happens. But I think you're gonna have to take the, you know, take the effects channel and even just momentarily just send it to the group if you wanted the reverb to be isolated. So let's just. Yeah. Yeah. Or, you know, export them separately. So, you know, I think. 
you know, because the signal, you know, is again, the groups are going, I'll see if I could come up with some other workaround, but, you know, just understand that, you know, the drums are being routed. You know, if you wanted to isolate the drums with their effects, you know, just put that effects return channel, you know, in the group because otherwise it's going to bypass that because it's not, you know, it's going down a parallel signal path. Okay, so we have a question. Uh, I like to use complex relationships between tracks, frequencies, or automation on one track, create space, create space of some other function on another track automatically like a side chain, but for many parameters simultaneously across multiple tracks. I could do that in live by linking macro knobs for any parameter on any other track and splitting signals to route them anywhere. Uh, you know, even inverted or transformed somehow. Is this currently any way to replicate this type of functionality in Cubase? Is it coming in the future? I rely heavily in this kind of workflow too. So we used to have that in the older days of mixer maps. And I think you could do it through like for external hardware through the device panels. Uh, but the problem got to be that a lot of people inadvertently would set up the wrong things and they would move one parameter and, you know, adjust a different parameter entirely. So that's kind of why they went on the aired on a side of caution. So there's kind of one parameter active, one knob to control particular parameters at a time. So I think we may see some, you know, changes with that. So it's not as strict. So you could have that type of workflow. Um, and a secondary question, I also work with, uh, modular equipment and, and the like to control the signals with the actual RMS level of another track, i.e. a base uh, track audio output is sent to the filter section of another track as the base on track a plays, uh, the RMS of the waveform is converted to CV, which I can then invert to apply automation on the filter track, uh, B. Um, so question is, will we see it built into Cubase ever? I love my modular kit and getting CV control to audio signals down light pipe is pretty common. I think now integrating DAW and modular is high up in my priority list, but I'm stuck with live right now to accomplish that. But I hate live's arrangement looks in lack of doing anything else well. So I, I don't think it's still very common. Uh, I think if you have a modular, it might be kind of a common workflow. So, you know, there's all sorts of little caveats of, you know, especially making sure that your audio interface is DC coupled when you're doing this type of work and a lot of interfaces aren't. So I don't think it's quite as mainstream, uh, yet. Um, you know, I generally don't know what's coming in future versions of Cubase. You know, there could be, you know, stuff like this coming, but, you know, we haven't had a lot of requests for it. I think probably if you search through all the live streams, you know, there's out of 12,000 questions, there's probably not the highest of priority. I'm not saying that they won't do it, uh, but I'll definitely kind of pass it along as feedback. So thanks for reaching out and letting us know. Okay, and this is also kind of a follow-up from last week. Uh, thanks so much. Uh, that is close to what I was looking for, but is there a way for those arranger markers or some kind of marker to physically move the contents of the whole session? So I could say copy and slide the entire section and see what the whole section and see the whole session move. For example, I mix multiple songs in one session, and for some reason I want to rearrange the order of the songs. I can open up and highlight all the automation, audio MIDI, and then copy, paste, et cetera. But in this other day, in this other DAW, when I moved what looked like a cycle marker, it would move everything underneath it within the session, which is really handy. The functionality in Arranger you showed is very similar, but I can I can certainly put that in my workflow. Uh, thanks for your time and energy. So this question was kind of getting back to, let me just revert this project. Okay, so let's say if we have a marker track, uh, and let's say if we have you know automation going on, so I will just OK, 
Okay, so I will come over here. So let's say I have uh, in here, I'm gonna add just cycle markers. Let me just undo that. Sorry about that, let me just. Okay, so if we do this, so let's say if I want to, and I'll just take off the, so I wanna take my marker with all of its automation and be able to kind of move it as a single entity. So if I wanted to, the trick is if you have the range tool selected, and I think this will help, uh, you could double click between in the marker track and now you could move everything with its automation around as you see fit. So once you have the cycle marker set, just double click with the range selection tool. That will do a global selection. So that will include all of your automation. So if you want to come over here, hold down the alt key and you could make a copy with all of the automation. So again, if you wanted to just double click between the cycle markers, or between two markers, that will do a global selection that you can now just freely move and rearrange with all the automation. Okay, so I just see uh, next question mailed in. Uh, why don't I see in the Steinberg Download Assistant that I purchased Cubase? I think it needs to show me in the Purchase Software tab, right? Uh, if it shows me just only, uh, only again, if I enter my download access codes, is it okay? So yeah, the, the download assistant isn't tied to your purchase because once you buy Cubase, you may want to just download it again on other computers. So the, the you know, it, the, so a lot of people erroneously will use the Steinberg download assistant and think that they could download everything that they could install it and run it free. Uh, but it's really, you only run the stuff that you, you know, have purchased or have a license for that, you know, so it's kind of a, an area where everything could be downloaded, you know, but it doesn't make sense to download something that you haven't purchased. So, you know, if you know that you've entered in your download access code, you'll see it'll take you directly to the downloads for that access code. So you could do the licensing, uh, you know, authorize the, you know, the e-licensor. And at that point, you know, it'll take you directly to the download, but you could go back at any time and download other utilities or download different trial versions to, you know, try different stuff out. So th that's okay if that works that way. All right, another question. Uh, is it possible to turn off hit points in the audio editor by default? So when we go into the audio editor, we can see uh, hit points generally that will be turned on. So if you don't have the hit points selected, you won't see them, but the hit points will automatically be calculated as the audio is being recorded. And I think if we go to editing and it's maybe under audio, um, I think there is a setting for this. Uh, okay, so you could just click, try going to event display uh, to audio. And here you could say show. So in, you, you know, there's a show hit points on selected tracks. So now that I have this track selected, if we zoom in, I could see the kind of the hit points. Uh, on that particular track. So go over here to preferences, uh, event display audio and uncheck show hit points on selected tracks. So give that a shot. All right, a uh, question is mailed in. When you have meter bridge activated on a mix console and audio track showing as waveforms, is there a way to navigate to a particular part of the waveform from the mix console without having to switch back to the project window? Uh, so if you're not familiar with this concept, if we go into, 
our meters here, we could switch this to wave meters. All right, and this is really intended more to show you exactly what is coming in the meters. It's not really intended to be like an editor where you could double click and go back to the project window. So, you know, you just hit F3 to open and close the, the uh, mix console and go back, but it's not really tied into the waveform meters. All right, I think that was all the questions that were sent in. Thanks for all the wonderful questions. Let's go ahead and see, I'll go back to our live stream questions. I'm sure we have some more questions. All right, so I just see a comment from Gareth. Well done for distracting his daughter from the computer game. Uh, Greg, it's more than I can do. Yeah, I just keep telling my son that you know, all my computers are too old to run games. So it seems to be working so far, but I'm sure it won't last long. Okay, uh, so I just see on the topic of chord tracks, I tried to edit a chord symbol that was labeled incorrectly. I opened the chord editor, but I couldn't make the tension show up on the chord track. Uh, the tensions were not blacked out, yet clicking on them made, a no, made no effect. Uh, do you know why? So let's say if we have a chord track, um, there are some settings in the chord track. So when we come over here, you could say set up voicings, you know, make sure that it could be that perhaps the um, option is only set to triads. So on the chord track itself, you'll see a set up voicings. So maybe just check your voicing options here and that might have an effect. All right, so we see John Koskin sharing his revelation of the day, uh, control plus left or right arrow to slide event even in milliseconds. That's, yeah, it's a good trick. All right. Okay, so I see uh, from um, from Sven. So yeah, I'll see if I could check with my friend. But I think I thought it was the UC one that you mentioned in your email. Reading through comments. All right, so I just see, uh, can you move multiple tracks up or down at once? So let's say if I just want it to come here. Um, so with this, I think we could, you know, just move it like so. So you could just select multiple tracks like that and move as you want. So if I wanted to move it out of the folder between the bass and guitar, we could do that.
see a comment from Gareth that Groove Agent is less than how many millions of micro buttons you can fit in one window. It's just, just great options and features. Yeah, it's like see, uh, on my son telling him that the computers are too old, so saying that my son Ryan will get wise and he'll probably start modding them. So I think he'll take him, he'll start working on his soldering iron with him. All right, so I think we are at the end of the questions. I'll see if there's any more questions. If not, we can wrap up a couple minutes early. But let me just make sure. And if there's any other questions, I'll just hang out for a moment and we'll just wait. So I see from uh, Renee, it's no more Cubase live stream. It's a Cubase ice stream. So it's a Cubase live stream with virtual ice cream. So bonus. All right, so I get a gold trophy from Agent K for getting through all the questions. I'll wait another minute or so and see if there's anything else. If not, we'll wrap up a little early. Okay, so I see Gareth will have a question about the craziest stuff you could do with hit points next time. All right. I'll try to come up with something creative for you. Um, so I just see question quickly, is there a performance difference between Big Sur and the previous one? So I think the previous one was Catalina. So I don't think that there is a huge performance difference. I, I'm still running Mojave on my Mac just because we had to kind of keep our operating systems that we got with our particular um, computer. So, uh, but I, I haven't heard of like a performance difference uh, overall. Okay, uh, is there a way to reset original default velocity for a project or should a standard setting be made, say like 89, like a mezzo forte for instance, uh, then new notes when key strike pressure them overrides? So if you want to, there is a setting, so let's say if we have, um, let's say just a quick, MIDI event here. Um, all right, so as I go to enter in notes, we'll see that the velocity here will be consistent. Uh, and we just see if it's, you'll see in the settings page here that you have an insert velocity option. So once we've inserted that, you could have four different modes that you could switch between. So you could have it default to 90, 70, 50, 120, or if you wanted it to set up, and you could have four different velocity levels that could be saved as presets as well.
Okay, so we have a question from Millard Brown. Uh, what is the difference between freeze instrument and freeze instrument and channel? So when we come, let's say if I had a lot of effects and processing on the particular uh, track. So if I come here, let's go to the VST instrument and we get freeze. So when we do the freeze instrument, that's just gonna take the MIDI information that's routed to audio and be able to just render that. But if we choose with channels, that would include all the EQs, inserts, and I think the effect sends would automatically be included. So that's the difference between the instruments and the freeze instrument channels. Okay, so with that, I think we're out of questions. We'll end maybe about 10 minutes early. I wanna thank everyone for a great live stream. We will do it again on Friday, starting at 1 p.m. US Eastern. Uh, I want everyone to stay safe and healthy, and we will see everyone on Friday. Look forward to more questions. Thank you very much. Bye.